the first episode of the Catholic Mass here on the SSPX podcast. We're excited to get started on this, on what will probably be about a year-long series, examining the theology, the history, the rubrics, the changes in the Mass, and so much more. But why spend so much time on simply one topic? Because the Mass is the center of our faith, and it is an inexhaustible topic. We can always dive deeper into the mysteries contained in this, our Lord's sacrifice, and the greatest catechism that the Church offers us. And so we'll do as much as we can to share this with you with as much information as possible. We've made a new page as well on sspxpodcast.com slash mass. You'll be able to find all of these episodes, videos, and resources. And this is free to listen to and always will be. But if you can help with a one-time or small monthly recurring donation, you'll be making sure that we can continue this work of producing good Catholic content. Now let's join Father Paul Robinson for the Catholic Mass, Episode 1. Father Robinson, again, you and I are kicking off a brand new series. Hello, how are you? I'm well, Andrew. Yes, a new series on the Mass. This is the first episode. Uh, We're really excited to do this series. As you know, we uh, just finished a couple series of the Apologetic series, the Digital Danger series. And so... um, we thought the next series that we should have would should be on the mass. As you know, uh, the mass is once more under attack. Um, with uh, 2021, mm-hmm. there's Tradiciones Custodes uh, severely restricting the celebration of the traditional mass in the various dioceses around the world, um, and effectively revoking some more pontificum of uh, Pope Benedict XVI. And now we have some rumors. I mean, we're making this recording at the end of June, but. Um, there's some rumors that there, there's another document prepared that might be coming forth to further restrict the mass, effectively saying that the, the no, there cannot be any diocesan Latin masses. We'll see if that comes to fruition. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, it, it, the, the, the more the mass is restricted, the more important it is for us to um, appreciate the mass and, and understand we, why we are fighting for it. In other words, I mean, like the harder you have to fight for a thing, um, the harder it is to continue to fight. So if we don't understand uh, why we're, we're really clinging on to this Mass and want this Mass and are not willing to go to the Novus Ordo, uh, then, uh, then eventually we'll, we'll give it up under the pressure that's, that's being put upon us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if Father Pali Rani, he, you know, our Superior General, he pens some very beautiful words right after Traditionus Custodes um, that I, th- I thought I'd just mention in this context of, of how we really have to be ready to um, fight for this Mass. He said, This Mass, our Mass, must really be for us like the pearl of great price in the Gospel, for which we are ready to renounce everything, for which we are ready to sell everything. He who is not prepared to shed his blood for this Mass is not worthy to celebrate it. He who is not prepared to give up everything to protect it is not worthy to attend it. So, you know, if if we uh, if we really appreciate this traditional mass and we really love it, then we will shed our blood. Uh, but if we don't, yeah. Yes. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have been very excited about this this series as well, and and we're going to talk in, here in a second about the different things that we're going to be talking about. Um, but the, the mass is everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to under or overstate, sorry. It's hard to overstate, uh, the importance of the holy sacrifice of the mass. It's not just about what we do on Sundays. It is the source and the summit of everything. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, it's the very heart of our religion and therefore the very heart of our relationship with God and our purpose as, as human beings. So um, be, because the Mass is, is the center of our religion and because it comes from God, um, there's just a lot to learn about it. I mean, uh, we know that with all the mysteries of our faith, they are inexhaustible because they concern God who is infinite. But that's also true of the Mass, that we can always learn more uh, about the Mass. And that's why in this series, we're going to be able to spend a lot of time talking uh, about the Mass, because there's, there's an awful lot to talk about. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that going through all these different topics in relation to the Mass, um, those who listen will 
will understand the mass more and as they say appreciate it more so so that's um definitely a, a, the major objective so but, but as they say you know there's just there's a lot to talk about um but but another thing is is, yeah. is that the mass is is very close to us as sspx priest the archbishop he wanted the spirituality of the sspx to be focused on the mass um, he famously told us that he did not want us to have a special spirituality he wanted us to have the spirituality of the church herself and what is that spirituality it's the spirituality of our lord which is the the spirituality of the cross um, and by extension of the mass so in other words um, when we ask ourselves, what was what was our Lord's whole reason for coming on this earth? What was He all about? He was all about redeeming us and, and saving our souls. How did He do that? He did that through the cross, um, and He established the Mass as a renewal of His sacrifice on Calvary. And what is the mission of the Church? The mission of the Church is to continue the work of our Lord to to make His act of redemption fruitful in time um, until the end of the world. And so the church's spirituality is, is the mass. Um, the, 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 the church's mm -hmm. uh, main focus is the mass. So Archbishop Lefebvre said to us, that's what I want you to be your focus. And uh, the, the SSPX priests, the SSPX brothers, the SSPX sisters, we all have this special devotion to the mass. Um, I just want to, to quote to you a few passages from our statutes, the statutes that, that uh, the Archbishop penned for our congregation. One of the things he says, he says, the life of the society's members for whom to me to live is Christ is a reality, quote from St. Paul, is entirely orientated towards the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is an extension of our Lord's sacred passion. He also says, the society must orientate the priest towards and help him achieve in his daily life what is essentially his raison d'etre, the, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, with all that it signifies, all that derives from it, and all that complements it. And so, as I say, that, that's what he wanted us to focus upon, but not just the priest. He, he mentioned the priest in there, but all of the members. He, he kind of had this vision of um, the, the priestly order where you have the priest at the altar and, and around the altar, uh, the, the brothers and the sisters all uniting in this sacrifice of the Mass, all focused on the sacrifice of the Mass. So another thing that he said was, the society's members will have a true and continual devotion towards their Holy Mass, towards the liturgy which enshrines it, and towards everything which contributes to make the liturgy more expressive of the mystery accomplished in it. They will be anxious to leave nothing undone in preparing spiritually and materially for the sacred mysteries. So the, the, God willing, um, we're continuing that spirit of our founder by having a great love for the Mass, great appreciation for the Mass, and I'm hoping that will that will come out in this series and also help others uh, have that same love. Yeah, those are uh, those are beautiful words, Father. Um, I I have taught a liturgy class for high school students for the last couple of years, and and at the very beginning, the very first day, the first thing I tell them is about why we are spending a whole semester on liturgy, and I tell them you cannot love what you don't know, um, and I think. I'm putting words in your mouth, Father, but I presume that is sort of what we are doing here, trying to educate people, not just on the importance of the Mass, because I think most people who are watching this would recognize, yes, the Mass is important. But the more that people learn about it, and I certainly have by teaching, um, the, the greater appreciation you have for it. So what are we going to be doing during this series? Yeah. So... Um uh, as I say, our main objective is to uh, explain the, the Mass in, from many different perspectives uh, in order to give people an appreciation of it. Because as you say, if you can't, you can't love something you don't know. And if, if something is truly valuable, then the more you know it, then the more you're going to love it. Um, whereas if something's um, 
not so valuable. <laughs> the more you love it, the, the less you'll appreciate it. So the mass is supremely valuable. And we're going to take a deep dive. We're really going to take a deep dive. Uh, we have awesome. a plan of uh, a schematic for, for the episodes of, of the series. There's going to be at least 40 episodes. I, d- I don't know uh, ultimately how many there will be because each priest who's doing the episodes, he will have the option of splitting up his topic into multiple episodes. Um, but okay. let me just cover what, uh, what those episodes are going to be about. Um, there's going to be an intro. Um, this, this is obviously the, the uh, first episode, and I'm just trying to give an overview of the episodes. But uh, the intro will cover such things like the, the, uh, the ends of the Mass, the, the purposes of the Mass, um, and you know, the, uh, the, the, the topics about the history of the Mass and, and so on. Um, but then after that, we are, are going to um, look at specifically at the history in detail. I want to take a chronological look at the development of the Mass over time, um, starting really with the Old Testament and seeing how the Mass was prefigured in the Old Testament, um, and then um, how our, our Lord instituted the Mass, the Last Supper, and then look at the, the first Christian liturgies, and then hone in on the traditional Latin Mass, what we, what we call the Mass of all time, and see how it developed over the centuries um, and was, was canonized, of course, by Pius V, and then come to the 20th century where uh, the Mass and the liturgy came under attack by the deviation of the liturgical movement. Um, so we're going to go through that, that entire history. Then we're going to tackle the theology of the Mass, um, just give the Catholic perspective on, on what happens at the Mass, um, and look at various heresies that, that attack the theology of the Mass. For instance, you know, Martin Luther and the Reformers um, denied the reality of what happens at the Mass, and some of them denied the real presence. And then, uh, uh, again, another look at the uh, liturgical movement of the 20th century, this time looking at what uh, it, it's, it's bad theology that led ultimately led to the new Mass. After the theology, we're going to try to give an explanation of the Mass. We're, we're going to take the Mass and go step by step through all the parts of the Mass and explain uh, what, what's contained in the Mass and also why those parts are where they are. Um, mm-hmm. so we, you know, we, we the, the significance of, of those parts of the mass and, it, hopefully this will give people the ability to assist at mass with more, uh, attention and devotion to understand more deeply what goes on when they're there. Um, and then there's, there's going to be a series of, of episodes on what I'm calling kind of the livery of the mass. Um, there, these are, these are things that per, pertain to the mass, but they're not the mass itself. Um, such as the, the vestments that the priest wears at Mass, um, the church architecture, which was which is built for the Mass. You know, Catholic churches are built for the Mass. Um, Catholic art that, that that accompanies the Mass, the different types of Mass, the low Mass, high Mass, solemn high Mass, that sort of thing. Um, the singing that, that takes place at Mass, the various forms of music that have um, been used throughout the history. In, in the Mass, such as Gregorian chant and the polyphony, of course, and also the different ministers that are there at Mass, uh, the bishop, the priest, you know, deacon, subdeacon, and, and all that. Um, and so, sorry, Father, just real quick. Did you say the liberty of the Mass? The liturgy the, of the Mass? The livery. The livery. Oh, livery. The oh, livery. livery. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you said liberty, and I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm waiting. This will make sense. Yeah, okay, we're, we're, praying, we're praying for the liberty of the Mass. Um, and we, we have, to, course, we have yeah. to keep praying. It's getting less liberty. but <laughs> It sort of made sense. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, one of those old that. words, the, the livery, you know, like uh, it's, it's, it's clothing, it's, tra- it's it. trappings, it's external trappings. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was just trying to think about what, what would be the, uh, the good word to describe that, that series of conf- no, it's great. conferences. Um, then the, lit- the liturgical year, we're going to cover the liturgical year. Um, a lot of people know about Dom Guerranche's multi-volume work about the liturgical year. 
Uh, we're talking about the temporal cycle, which goes through the life of our Lord in the year, and then the sanctoral cycle, which is the celebration of the Feast of the Saints. Um, and for, for something that I, I think everybody will appreciate is, is we're going to take we're going to take the Angelus Missal, um, or one of the priests is going to take the Angelus Missal and explain to people how to use a missal, how how do you use uh, a hand missal? Um, we talk about the church's uh, spirit on participating in mass. What's what's the best way to participate in mass when when you go to mass uh, in order to draw the greatest fruits, and also the divine office in connection to mass. There's a relationship between the divine office and the mass, and to see how they're related to one another. Uh, then, of course, we we will cover the uh, liturgical crisis, the modern liturgical crisis, the introduction of of the new mass. Uh, or where it came from, and why it's problematic, um, and, and why the SSPX uses the 1962 missile um, as opposed to some other missile, including why the SSPX does 1962 Holy Week as opposed to what's called the Pre-55 Holy Week. So uh, that will all be covered in the sort of liturgical crisis section. And then there will just be uh, um, some some other miscellaneous kind of miscellaneous topics uh, going over some some good books on the mass, recommended reading on the mass, um, also talking about the reception of the Holy Communion and the, the devotion to the Holy Eucharist. Um, and then finally, we'll just we'll just wrap up uh, talking a little bit about Archbishop Lefebvre's fight for the mass and um, how that fight continues. You know, uh, especially as I say today when. And the mass is really uh, coming under under attack. Yeah, uh, that sounds really comprehensive, and um, I am I'm very excited. Again, like I said, I've, I've been I've been working through my own version of of this for the last few years, and and I I can't wait to dive even deeper uh, with you and the other priests about it. Yeah, well, um, well, you work so hard on these podcasts, Andrew. But I guess maybe one, hopefully, one little fringe benefit is is you, you get to uh, deepen your knowledge of, of all these topics that you've been participating yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When when people talk with me about it and they say, "Oh, thank you for for hosting these," and I say, I, "I'm the one who's grateful. I get a front row seat <laughs> to, to every single episode. It's wonderful." Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's look at at some definitions that we're going to be using. Uh, as we go through this series, um, I, I guess let's start about, you know, what is what is the mass and, and what do we mean when we talk about uh, the mass? And then let's dig into some of the uh, various parts of it. Yeah. So um, with this episode, with this first episode, I, I wanted to give an introduction um, to the, the whole series by, by saying, OK, this is what our series is. This is what is why we're doing it. This is what it's going to be about but also to talk about kind of the first topic, and that is <clears throat> the, what the Mass is. Give, give a definition of the Mass. It's very typical, especially in the scholastic manuals, that when you uh, go to do a definition, you start with what's called the etymological definition. And that's basically going back to how we name the thing. And it's like, let's, let's look at how we name the thing and see if we can find out something about it from the names. And then from there, we go on to what's called the real definition, which is um, our best explanation of what a thing is. So we're going to start with uh, the etymology of, of the mass, uh, like where the word mass comes from. I also talk about other names that have been given to the mass, because the fact is that our Lord didn't give a name to it. Um, our, our Lord instituted the mass at the Last Supper. He told the apostles do this in, in memory of me. But he didn't say what this is called. He didn't, he didn't say, this is what I want you to call this. Um, he just right. said, do this. Do this. Do these actions. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I'm going to be sort of taking um, some things from, from Father Pierre Lebrun's uh, The Mass. And, I mean, okay. um, this was recently translated by Harry Osman. Um, with Ubi Caritas Press. <clears throat> and when we were doing the sacrament series, I, I mentioned this book as a really helpful resource on the Mass. At the time, it only existed in French. And uh, Mr. Osman, he, he was listening to the podcast and was kind of uh, motivated to, 
you do the translation. So, to, so now it's available, which is, uh, which is great. Oh, just, just in time for this, for this podcast series. Um, so this fellow Lebron, he, um, he says that the church is giving many names to the mass over time. Some of the names say what happens at mass while others seek to hide the mysteries of the mass from those who are not among the faithful. So the earliest names of the mass um, gave a name to it, but didn't really say what was going on in the mass because it was meant to be hidden. It was kept secret in the first centuries of the church. So here's some of those names. The mass, of course, has been called liturgy. Um, liturgy is a Greek word, just means public service. Um, it's also been called the synaxis or yeah. um, the, the, the gathering. That means the gathering or the assembly, of course. The Novus Ordo kind of liked that, that, that name for the Mass. Um, it's been called the offices of the divine sacraments, the solemnities or the divine solemnities, the sacrifice, the oblation, the supplication, the venerable, the holy, the divine, the fearsome mysteries. It's been... It's been called all those things. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously in the Novus Ordo today, they call it the Eucharist. Um, that's not one of the, the names that the fellow Lebron mentions. But um, the liturgy, the, the mass being called the lit liturgy, you probably know, is, is used by the Eastern Church from, from the earliest mm -hmm. times, really the beginning of the 4th century, so like the, the early 300s. Um, Eastern Catholics have called the Mass the Divine Liturgy, whereas Western Catholics in the Roman Rite have called it the Mass, the Mass. So I just want to explain uh, where the word Mass comes from. And you see that in the other uh, sort of the, in the Romance languages, they have a very similar word, Spanish, La Misa, or in French, uh, la messe, la messe. Um, but this this word mass it comes from the the word missio or misa, um, which means ascending, ascending away. Um, mm -hmm. We get the word mission from from that. Oh. And the uh, the reason why the mass is given that name is is because <clears throat> there there were originally two sending aways. Uh, during the Mass. One was at the offertory, uh, right before the offertory, where the catechumens were, were sent away. They, uh, they were told to depart uh, before the, the actual sacrifice, sacrificial part of the Mass started. Uh, they had to be baptized before they were allowed. I mean, uh, Father Lebron, says that the Church in, in her mercy has, uh, over, over time, allowed um, basically non-Catholics to attend the whole Mass, but it didn't used to be that way they felt that uh, at the beginning of this part was too sacred for those who were not baptized to be there. So they sent them away. They uh, gave them the Misa <laughs> at that point. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you know, at the end of the Mass, the, uh, the priest sends the, the, the faithful away, the, the, the Catholics away. He, said, he tells them the Mass is over by saying, Ite Misa est. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, because of these, these, uh, Sendings away that take place in the mass, the, the ultimately the the whole ceremony was called by that name, the mass, and it was a way, as I say, of kind of hiding what actually took place. It's not really saying it's just we're just calling it the sending away, <laughs> um, uh, but um, Saint Augustine spoke of the mass in in that way. He, uh, he said that the sending away of the catechumens takes place while the faithful remain. Feet misa, um St. Isidore, around the year 600, says the sending away is at the time of the sacrifice when the catechumens are sent outside. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the name that, is, that has come down to us, and that's the name that, that is really uh, stuck. Um, it was the best word to to keep secret what happens during the mass, while at the same mm. time giving one um, kind of a high idea of, of what uh, of the mass itself. Because 
it, it, it implies the, the sacredness of the mass. You're saying, okay, okay. people get sent away um, at a certain point because there's a really sacred part. So it's, that, that word is kind of focusing on, on that. Um, there's only a select group, those who have judged to preserve or recover the grace of baptism, who are allowed to be there, whereas uh, the unbaptized Christians, the, the catechumens, or Christians doing public penance, or infidels were all sent away. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't just the non-baptized, but even penitents. Um, back in the days when, when you had to do really harsh penances for, for major sins like murder or adultery, um, you were not allowed to come into the church, to be in the church during the sacrificial part of the Mass. Oh, it's very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that that has been relaxed. I mean, okay, I just realized what that sounded like. It sounds like I've committed murder <laughs> and adultery. Uh, I have not. Um, uh, well, and yeah. if I had, I wouldn't be telling you here. Um, Time to go to confession, but, Andrew. <laughs> uh, can we do it over, uh, over a podcast? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that would be good. <laughs> okay. Um, well, now, okay. That, we'll talk to Father I, Justin with Catholic Answers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Well, I just threw us off. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so we have relaxed this. And so thus we have uh, the word, the mass. Um, the any the other mass. definitions that you want to <laughs> go through here, Father? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after going through all those names that, that kind of um, describe in, to some degree what's going on in the mass, but, but really don't do a thorough job of it, then we will come to the, what, what's known as the real definition of the mass, uh, which is the best, most thorough definition that we can give. And um, that is given to us by the Council of Trent. Okay. So <clears throat> here's uh, what Trent says that the mass is. The mass is a true and proper sacrifice in which the bloody sacrifice once accomplished on the cross is represented in which the same Christ is contained and immolated in an unbloody manner and offers his own body and blood through the ministry of the priest under the species of bread and wine to God the Father, the manner alone of offering being different. So this is a very complete and thorough definition. Um, and I just want to go through some of the things it says about the Mass. So we unpack this definition a bit so that we can understand what it's saying. So it starts off by saying that the Mass is a true and proper sacrifice. The trend is saying it's a real sacrifice. It's an actual sacrifice. It's not just a symbol. It's not, it's not a, uh, merely a symbol of a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice where you have a victim actually offered to God. Um, so the reality of what we think of when we hear the word sacrifice is you have some victim offered to God by a priest. That's really happening at the Mass. Then it says a representation of the sacrifice of the cross. And I don't know what the best word in, in English is, but when we think of representation, we think of some hollow image yeah. of a reality, but not actually the real thing. And so I think it's sometimes better to think of this word as representation. Representation. I mean, that, that's the actual word, but we don't think of representation as representation. In this case, that's what it means. It means a representation. Okay. We, we uh, present to the Heavenly Father once more the same victim that was offered on Calvary, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, okay. that's what happens. Uh, that's what Trent means when it says, in which the bloody sacrifice once accomplished on the cross is represented. Um, so this is what makes the Mass the same sacrifice as that of Calvary, that we have the same victim um, as was present on Calvary. We have the same priest, which is also our Lord Jesus Christ, um, and it's for the same purpose of, of okay. giving homage to the Eternal Father. Um, then it says, the Trent says that the same Christ is contained and immolated in an unbloody manner. It says that Christ is immolated in the Mass. Um, and 
yet in a different manner from the way he was immolated on Calvary. We know that he was immolated on Calvary, and immolation means a slaying, you know, mm-hmm. a slaying of a victim. We know that our Lord was bloodily slain on Calvary. He died um, through crucifixion on Calvary. So Trent is saying that there is a there is an immolation also in the Mass, or that Christ is immolated also in the Mass, but in, in, a, in an unbloody manner. And this is done by what's called the sacramental sac- separation of the Eucharistic species. You have on the altar um, the, the host, which is wheat bread, and you, you have the wine, and they're both consecrated, and then you, they, but, they are, but they are separate. And that symbolizes the separation of the body and blood of our Lord on the cross. And because okay. um, God has given to the sacraments the power to cause what they symbolize, so at the Mass, um, the Mass causes, it symbolizes the separation of our Lord's body and blood, and so it, it causes our Lord's immolation, but in an unbloody manner. So our Lord doesn't die. Um, we have to be clear. <laughs> our Lord's not suffering, and, mm-hmm. and our Lord's not dying again. Um, mm-hmm. But there, there is this sacramental immolation of our Lord that takes place in the Mass. Very interesting. Wow. That, so, I don't, so, I don't so know if that why... makes sense. Yeah, it does. That's why there's, that's why when you perform the consecration, Father, you don't do both at the same time. You don't say, this is my body and this is my blood. You, it's a two separate actions. Well, I suppose theologically it's one, but, but you get what I mean. Yes, it's two separate formulas, two separate consecrations that take place. And that's also the reason why if the priest doesn't consecrate one of the species, it's not a mass. So the, uh-huh. the sacrifice is not accomplished unless both consecrations are done. So the double consecration is needed for the validity of the mass. So if the priest just consecrates the host and then receives the host, you know, for communion, um, then it's not a mass. Is sorry, this is I, I know this is a broad overview, but would our Lord be present in the host, even though it's not a mass? Yes. Yes, yeah, so our Lord uh-huh. would be present in the host, um, but there would not be a sacrifice that was accomplished at oh, that quote-unquote Mass. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's the sacramental presence of our Lord, um, but there's no immolation of our Lord, which is necessary for the sacrifice. For the sacrifice. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, th- thanks for that little tangent. Um, yeah. And then that last part of the, of the definition of Trent, offers his body and blood. Um, how, yeah. how, do we, how do we understand that, Father? Yeah. And then, so he's immolated in a bloody manner, and Christ offers his own body and blood through the ministry of the priest um, to God the Father. So our Lord, uh, what we have to understand is this is saying that our Lord he is the primary priest at each Mass, that he is present on the altar, and that he's offering himself while on the altar. To God, and this is what assimilates the mass to Calvary. Another another thing that assimilates the mass to Calvary um, is that our Lord, of course, offered Himself to the Heavenly Father, uh, His body and blood, while on the cross. He does the same thing at the mass. So <clears throat> this is what makes the mass the same offering that was accomplished two thousand years ago. Very interesting. Wow. Um, how can we understand? about how, how great the Mass is. And I know we're going to be doing it through the series, yeah. but can you give us some sort of introductory words about um, the, the, the excellence or the perfection of the Mass? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I thought it might be nice just to, to wrap up this uh, introductory episode. You know, we're not covering a lot of territory. It's, it's just to, to give an overview. I'm just talking about the definition of the Mass. But to, uh, to really emphasize, as I say, um, how great the Mass is. And I, I just want to give some of the words of Father LeBron at the beginning of his book. He, he talks about the excellence of the Mass. He talks about the fact that the Mass makes heaven present um, mm. on this earth. And then he also talks about how the Mass is effectively mirroring the liturgy of heaven that's going on right now. So, just want to give you three quotations from Father LeBron. 
on those topics. Um, first of all, on the excellence of the Mass, he says, there is nothing greater in religion than the sacrifice of the Mass. The other sacraments and almost all the offices and ceremonies of the Church are means or preparations for celebrating it or for participating worthily in it. In the Mass, Jesus Christ offers himself up for us to his Father. Every day, as the eternal priest, he renews the offering which he made for us once upon the cross, and he gives himself as food to the faithful, who thereby find at the altar the consummation of their spiritual life, since it is there that they nourish themselves on God himself. So this is, this is the, the greatness of the reality that, of what happens at the Mass, something that we cannot completely fathom as mere creatures. Um, so sublime is it. Mm. Then, then if we are able to see with eyes of faith what happens at the Mass, we, we are able to recognize that um, it makes heaven present on earth. Father Lurban says, We can t- say that the sacrifice of the Mass turns our churches into heaven. The Divine Lamb is immolated and adored there in the midst of the heavenly sanctuary. Just as St. John represents it to us, the blessed spirits who are informed about what is happening on our altars come to assist at the Mass with a trembling which the greatest respect inspires. This truth concerning the presence of angels at Mass has always been so well known. St. Gregory the Great did not hesitate to say, Which of the faithful can doubt that at the voice of the priest, at the very hour of the immolation, heaven opens up, the choirs of angels assist at the mystery of Jesus Christ, and heavenly and earthly creatures, visible and invisible, are united at that very moment. Mm. So, in this picture uh, that, that Father Urban represents, it's just like um, the, the angelic powers, they know what mass is taking place uh, around the, uh, the earth, and then they, they come, they come to the altar yeah. at that time. And you know how uh, a lot of the traditional chapels, they'll have two angels on the side of the yes. altar kind of represent that. Yeah, and then in the Immaculata, they got like the, the angels everywhere. And this yeah. is a representation of, of the liturgy of the apocalypse. Um, so, yeah. And then the, the last thing, the last quote, is just how there is a liturgy that goes on in heaven right now. There's a homage being given to God right now. And when we have the Mass, we are um, representing or accomplishing on earth what is being accomplished in heaven. He says, in our churches, we effectively do the same thing that the saints are continually doing in heaven. We adore here the holy immolated victim present in the hands of the priest. And all the saints adore this, that same victim in heaven, the lamb without stain, represented as being standing, but yet slain, in order to indicate his immolation and his glorious life. All the prayers and the merits of the saints are lifted up before the throne of God like a sweet perfume which St. John represented by the thurible which the angel holds in his hands, and by the altar from which the prayers of the saints rise up to God. The church on earth also offers incense to God on her altars as a sign of the adoration and prayers of all the saints who are here below or in heaven. All on heaven and on earth are adoring together because we have on our altars here below the same one who is seated on the heavenly throne. It was like this picture of our Lord up there in heaven. and the angels and the saints gathered around, you know, adoring God. And then we have our Lord here on earth, and we have the angels and, and the faithful adoring God. So we're making happen here below what happens in heaven. Wow, that's really beautiful. And and I'm sure it must be even more awe-inspiring for you, Father. I mean, it is for me, but to know that you, and again, no offense, unworthy as you are, as, as just a, <laughs> a, a, a man, has the ability to do that. It, it, um, it, it must be staggering for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to see, uh, and when we, we get to that part where we go through the parts of the mass, how often the priest is saying that he's unworthy mm-hmm. and of, of doing what he's doing. I mean, you, you can, you can look at the prayers of the mass. You see, it's, it's, it's quite frequent mm-hmm. that the, the priest is professing himself to be unworthy. Um, and I think it's interesting that just the something mysterious about the mass in the sense that the the the, the traditional mass at least is is just extremely scripted. Um, it's so precise in what what is meant to be done, and it's the same every day. 
you know, it's the exact same mm -hmm. every day. Um, yet one never tires of the mass. Uh, I mean, we, we, we say mass every day. Uh, there's a lot of faithful who attend mass every day and it's not boring. Um, you would, you would think uh, by human calculations, it would just, because it's so scripted, it would, it would be boring. But in fact, the mass is um, so elevating and nourishing to the soul that we do not tire, mm -hmm. we do not tire of the mass. Um, so that's a very beautiful thing for sure. Yeah. And, and I would say if, if you, and if you do feel speaking to our listeners, if you do feel a little bit bored going to daily mass, hopefully this series will help because there's so much, there's so <laughs> much richness in there. You can focus on a million different things. Uh, every day and never tire of it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I, there, there's, there's going to be a lot to talk about, Andrew, uh, in the upcoming episodes. And I hope people stay tuned with that. But um, I just want to close with a word from Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, kind of uh, addressing us all uh, in these times about the appreciation we need to have for the Mass. He says, nothing can be more salutary in our times than the rediscovery of the unfathomable riches of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. By meditation on the Mass and the union of our souls and bodies with the soul and body of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, we can obtain the salvation of souls and the return of Christian civilization. Mm. Um, so this is our dream that, that uh, we save our souls, first of all but also uh, through what we do in our life, through our devotion to the Mass, we make an impact on the society around us um, and hopefully bring back Christian civilization one day. Um, but meanwhile, yeah, cling tightly to yeah. that precious Mass that we have. Yeah. Father, I'm very excited. Can't wait to get started. And thank you so much for spearheading this project. It, I think it's going to be a wonderful help to so many people. My pleasure, Andrew. And uh, please uh, ask everybody, just keep the series in your prayers and God willing, it will accomplish a lot of good. Absolutely. Father, talk to you soon. Thank you.